Most of you would recognize, if you're a football fan, you'd recognize the name Vince Lombardi. He's one of the most famous NFL coaches of all time. In uh, 1960, they used to have the, the NFL championship for the Super Bowl, called, they called it Super Bowl. And in, in, at the end of the 1960 season, the Packers lost the game. And uh, they had won several in a seven-year stretch, seven stretch, but they lost that year. And they, the team got back together the first time in July of 1961. And Vince Lombardi wanted to take his team back to the basics. So he said what's now kind of a famous saying, you probably have heard it if you're a football fan. He comes into all these professional athletes, these professional football players, holds up a football and says, gentlemen, this is a football. And that's where he started. Got back to the basics. So this morning, I'm going to take us back to some spiritual basics. A holy and righteous God created man to bear his image to share his same moral character. But God made it optional for us to be righteous. He wanted a relationship with man. He didn't want robots who just did what they were programmed to do. So he set up a test in the Garden of Eden, and as you know the story, Adam and Eve failed that test. God had decreed that in his world, choices would have consequences. And boy, did they. The result of man's sin was separation from his created world. The result of man's sin was separation from God and, uh, and, and, a now, and now having a broken nature. The created world that he was intended to rule over was now a mess, broken, and under a curse. Mankind moved from having a problem-free life into a life full of problems. Yesterday morning, I spoke to our uh, students, our, uh, the guys at youth camp. And one of the things I talked about is that God is, is, loves us more than anybody else ever could. He's good. He's better than anybody else ever is. He's all-knowing. When we have an option of three choices, he knows what will happen any three choice we pick. He can project the future. We're just guessing at it. And he's wise. God has never made decision and thought, well, I wish I'd done that differently. I've made those, haven't you? But he's never has. And if it's that kind of God, and he loves us, and he's that good, then why in the world wouldn't we follow him? And then when we do the wrong thing, there's always a price that we pay for doing that wrong thing. And we learn that, we go all the way back to, to Adam and Eve. So for example, we have, a, we have a big political divide in America today, don't we? You know why? Because Adam sinned. We got people without homes and, and their lives just almost destroyed along the North Carolina-Tennessee border. You know why? Because of sin. We got this incredible divorce rate in all these broken homes. You know why? Because Adam chose to sin. You and your wife, none of us have perfect marriages. You have your times where it's hard and difficult. You know why? Because Adam chose to sin. We have hospitals all around town full of people. You know why? Because Adam chose to sin. I bet you've been to a funeral recently, at least in the last several months. Many of us have been to a lot of them. You know why? Because Adam chose to sin. Sin always has a negative consequence. It always does. And so now, because Adam sinned, but prior to that, Adam and Eve had a problem-free life. Now their life is absolutely full of problems. Physically, they'd get sick and eventually die. Everyone still does. Relationally, Adam and Eve were now at odds with each other. Conflict has reigned supreme ever since. Mankind's biggest problems, though, are all spiritual. All of us come into this world disconnected from God and actually standing condemned before him because of Adam's sin and now ours. So this morning, I'm going to talk about the biggest problems man faces, his problems with God. I'm calling this man's problems, God's solutions. Unlike I typically do, I've printed the scripture we'll use in today's outline. So look there, we're going to read Romans 5, 6 to 12, and then Romans 8, to 18 to 19. Romans 5, 6. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, 
Having now been justified by his blood, <clears throat> we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult, rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. Verse 18. So then, as, as through one transgression there resulted the, con the condemnation of all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, that of Christ, there resulted in justification of life to all men, available to all men. For as, th as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, literally all of us, even so, through the obedience of the one, Jesus, the many, will be made righteous. So let's talk about man's biggest problems. He has three. Number one, man's first problem is who he is. It's who he is. In Romans 5, 6, it describes man as being helpless. In other words, he doesn't have what it takes to be who he ought to be. He's now broken. There's someone he's supposed to be, he was made to be, but he doesn't have it in him to be that person because of his brokenness. Verse 6 also describes him as being ungodly. This doesn't mean he's the worst he could possibly be. It means he's not like he's supposed to be, which is to be like God in whose image he was created. And then in verse 10, it says that men are enemies of God. We're enemies of God in the sense that we want to be our own God rather than following him as God. We all want to make up our own rules. We all want to decide what we will and we will not do. We don't want anybody else to tell us what to do, including God. And so he's, he calls us enemies. Adam and Eve were created without sin. They were innocent. Genesis 1.26 says, says they were created in God's image and likeness. When they sinned, though, they became sinners, and then they passed down, Adam passed down his sinful nature to, to his offspring, which includes all of us. So Genesis 5.3 tells us that Adam's children were born not in God's image and likeness, but in Adam's image and likeness. They were born as sinners. This is described in Romans 5.19 here where it says, Through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So since Adam's sin, everyone has been born as a sinner. It's why you don't have to teach your children to do the wrong thing. Not, none of us had to teach our children to be selfish. None of us had to teach them to deceive. None of us had to teach them to lie. What we've all had to do is teach our children how to do the right thing. Why? Because they were born with this broken sin nature. If you'll recall, Adam's firstborn ended up murdering his, his secondborn out of jealousy. So man's first problem is who he is. He was created to be like God, and he's not. His nature is now broken by sin. He's unable to be the person God intended him to be. Number two, man's second problem is what he has done. It's what he has done. Because we are who we are, we do what we do. And what men do is sin. In Romans 5, 8, we're called sinners. Verse 12 tells us that all have sinned. Look at Romans 3, 23. All have sinned. That, in the Greek, the word all means all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To sin is to miss the mark. It's, it's the distance between the bullseye and where your arrow or bullet, whatever you're shooting, would land. It's to fail to be who we're supposed to be because we're supposed to be like God. We glorify God when we act like he would act and do the things that he would do if he were us. That's how we glorify him. When we don't act like he would act, we don't do the things he would do, then we fall short of glorifying him. We fall short of his glory. All men are capable of good because they're created in God's image. On the same hand, all men are capable of terrible bad because we all have broken sin natures. What we learn from David and others in scripture is all of us are capable of the worst in us. 
And the worst in us is worse than we think it is. All of us know somebody that did something that we can't believe they did. We thought we knew them. That person would never do something like that. All of us are capable of the worst in us, and the worst in us is worse than we think. So we spend our lives trying to tame this broken nature in us. The Greek verb here in, in the Romans 3.23 says, not only have we sinned, we still do, not only have we fallen short of his glory, being like him, we still do. The Bible talks about, uses the word transgression to talk about a deliberate disobedience. So when you transgress, you know what you ought to do and you don't do it. Or you know what you ought not do and you do it. How many of you have done this at least once? Okay. Now, I did this when I was 15, one time. It's the only time, just one time. That's a joke. We've all done it, hadn't we? We've all knowingly done the wrong thing. That's a transgression. Sin isn't knowingly doing the wrong thing. Sin is missing the mark. When I don't love, I may love somebody, but not as I should have loved them. I've missed the mark. I've fallen short of his glory. I should have had a better attitude. I tried to have a better attitude. I wanted to have a better attitude, but I was still uh, jealous or petty or vengeful or bitter. I fall short. Make sense? That's why the Bible says we can never say we haven't sinned. Because sinning isn't a knowledgeable act where I do the wrong thing necessarily. Now, all transgression is sin, but not all sin is transgression. So I can fall short when I'm not trying to. I want to be the person God wants me to be, but I just didn't get it done. I just didn't get it done. So we've all sinned, and we still do. If the standard of what you should and should not do was based upon your own standard, you could find p plenty of people that you're better than. That makes sense? If I get to set the standards for what's good and not, how good you're supposed to be, I can find a lot of people that live beneath how I live, a lot who live maybe above me too, but, but I can feel pretty good because I'm better than they are. But the problem is I don't get to set my standards. The problem is you don't get to set your standard for what is good. That standard is set by a holy, righteous, perfect God. And so even though we might be better than a lot of people, we're not like him. Not even close. So we're in trouble. We are who we are, and because we are who we are, we've done what we've done, and what we've done is sin, and we're in trouble, which brings us to man's third problem. His third problem is where he's headed, where he's headed. Because we are who we are, we do what we do, and because we do what we do, we're headed where we're headed. And the Bible teaches, that man is, teaches us that man is headed for judgment. In Romans 5.18, it says, our sin has put us under condemnation. Verse 9 says that we need to be saved from wrath, from judgment. Look at Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's what sin earns. Sin earns death. Now, the word death here isn't talking about physical uh, death, which is the separation of the spirit and soul from the body. It's talking about spiritual death, which is the separation of the soul and spirit from God. Look at Luke 13.3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. Why? Because you're under condemnation and you're headed for wrath. There's something you've got to do to avoid this. You've got a big problem. You're headed for wrath. The holy God will judge sinful men based upon his standard, which is himself, which is beyond our ability to reach. So how many of you remember the name Evil Knievel? You remember that name? He was a motorcycle daredevil, uh, did a lot of crazy stuff. I think he broke every bone in his body one time or another. At one point, he tried to jump with this rocket bike over the Grand Canyon. Remember that one? Now, imagine that we decided we were going to try to jump over the Grand Canyon. Some of us would jump further than others, wouldn't we? Some of us would, we, we know that we could, you're looking around saying, well, I know I could jump further than that guy. I know I could jump further than her. Some of us could jump further than others. Some of us might feel good about ourselves that we can jump further than others. But here's the, here's the deal. Every one of us end up dead at the bottom. 
It doesn't matter that you can jump further than the next guy. You end up dead at the bottom. Why? Because nobody can jump the canyon. The canyon is our separation from God. And some people can act better than other people. But it doesn't matter. You're still going to end up dead at the bottom. We've got to have somebody do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. We've got to have somebody fix our problem. Why? Because, remember, we are our problem. Because we are who we are, we do what we do. Because we do what we do, we're headed where we're headed. And we're headed for wrath. We're headed for judgment. We're headed for the bottom of the canyon. In multiple places in Scripture, we're told that one day we're going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. And Jesus says that the majority of people will fail that test. So there's man's three biggest problems. Because of who he is, he does what he does. Because he does what he does, he's headed where he's headed. He's helpless, he's ungodly, so he sins and falls short. So he's headed for judgment and wrath. That's the bad news. But the good news is there's some good news. The word gospel means good news. So God in Christ has worked to solve all three of those problems. So turn your outline over and let's talk about God's solutions to man's problems. Under that, number one, Jesus saves us from where we are headed. He saves us from where we're headed. Romans 5, 9, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So Jesus came and lived the life that we didn't and couldn't. Jesus came and leaped the canyon. And then he suffered the penalty in our place for our sin. He was our substitute. So God punished his perfect son in order to be able to forgive sinners. God is just. He couldn't just ignore the wrong. He couldn't just pardon it because that would not be justice. Somebody had to pay the penalty. So God sends his own perfect son into the world who leaps the canyon. Therefore, he can represent all of us who, who were going to end up at the bottom. And then his son, he punishes his son for our sin. So the sin does get paid for, just not by those of us who give our lives to him. So it says in Romans 3, 26, that doing so, God is just, the sin gets punished, and he's the justifier. He's the one who solves our problem by punishing his own son and Jesus coming and suffering our literal hell. There's no better news than what God has done for us in Jesus. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates, I think King James says proves, that's what it's talking about. He proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No one does or even can love you like he does. And let me tell you this, all of us long for God's love. We were made for God's love and nothing but his love will perfectly satisfy us. So in a marriage, in a great marriage, there will be times it just won't be enough. You think, my wife or my husband's just great to me, but I long for more. You know why? Because you were made for more. You were made for love that your husband or wife can't give you. You're made for love that your children or grandchildren can't give you. This is for some of you. You're made for love your dog or cat can't give you. <laughs> You're made for his love. So don't throw away a good marriage because it's not enough. The next one won't be either. The only place you'll find enough is in him. And you won't fully find it, frankly, until heaven. If we follow Jesus now, we're forgiven rather than condemned. We're children of God rather than estranged from God. We're headed for heaven instead of wrath. Look at these great verses about heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God's prepared for those who love him. So what's he saying? In heaven, you're going to see things you've never seen. In heaven, you're going to hear things you've never heard. When Paul went to heaven and came back, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he didn't say a word about what he saw. He said he heard unspeakable things. That's really fascinating. And then it says that it's never entered into the heart of man what God's prepared. In other words, you can't even begin to imagine all that heaven will be. 
Look at Revelation 21, 3, to 3 and 4. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, just like in the garden. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things, the curse, has passed away. Then you go to chapter 22, verse 3, and it tells us there will no longer be any curse. There will no longer be any hospitals. There will no longer be any graveyards. There will no longer be any breakups. There will no longer be any disappointments. There will no longer uh, be fear and, uh, and, and uh, rejection and all the things we have. No longer floods, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because there will no longer be any curse. Then I think the most exciting verse of the whole Bible is chapter 22, verse 4 of Revelation. They shall see his face. Now, I want to ask you this. How many of you think God loves you? You know, the Bible says he does. How many of you think, I, I think God loves me. Raise your hand up high. Now, I want to tell you something as your pastor. You don't have a clue. <laughs> you don't have a clue. When you see his face someday... You'll get it. Now, I know God loves me and I love him, but I don't have a clue. When I look in his face someday, I don't know what real love is. And you will. And 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 for in and, and in forever, we won't get over it. Heaven won't grow stale or boring. Every day, you know, you know, the angels sing holy, holy, holy. Uh, or they say holy, holy, holy there in Revelation. In Isaiah, the curtains pull back, the angels say in holy, holy, holy. You, as you've been around here, you know that I, de I define the word holy as wow. God is wow. He's different from anything and everything else. He's infinitely higher than anything and everything else. He is wow. These angels have been with God, who knows, millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years. I, we don't know. But all we know is this, every time you pull the curtain back, they're saying, wow. Your first day in heaven is going to be a wow time. Your one billionth day in heaven is going to be just as wow. As God unfolds who he is, as we live in his love and goodness, it'll never get common or ordinary like it can here for us. Wow, they shall see his face. The follower of Jesus is no longer headed where he was headed. Why? Because Jesus died for him and save, will save him from wrath. That's his first problem where he's headed. Number two, Jesus saves us from what we have done. He saves us from what we have done. Because Jesus paid the price for our sin, we can be forgiven. Romans 5, 9 tells us that believers have been justified by his blood. There's power in the blood, power, wonder-working power. God no longer holds us uh, accountable for what we have done against him. The Bible says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, bringing us back to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. So Jesus solved the problem of what we have done by paying for our sins by his death. He literally suffered hell there on the cross during those dark hours after he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, hell is just simply the absence of God, but the absence of God means the complete absence of good because everything that's good comes from God. And so Jesus, who had been one with the Father in spirit forever, it's a long time, that day was by himself with nothing, not a speck of good in his life. He suffered hell for you. Therefore, God was just. Our penalty got paid. And Jesus was our justifier by taking our penalty for us. He solved our problem. He saved us from where we were headed. And he saved us by his death from what we have done. We have been justified by his blood. But there's another problem. See, the reason we're headed, we're headed is because we've done what we've done. But we've done what we've done because we are who we are. Number three, Jesus saves us from who we are. He saves us from who we are. 
In Romans 5, 10, it says, we shall be saved by his life. When we give our lives to Christ, his spirit comes to indwell us. If we're in Christ, we're believers, Christ is in us. It says in Corinthians, your body is a temple of the spirit of God who now lives in you. In Romans chapter 8, it says that uh, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says God is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. The Spirit of God now lives in the believer. We now have His power to be who we're supposed to be, but formerly we're unable to be. Watch this. Remember we said that we were helpless? We're not anymore. Now we have a helper. Christ in us is our helper. Look at these verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new person. He's not who he used to be. So I used to be weak. You're, you're not now. You can be. You can choose to be weak, but you have the power to be strong. I used to. I, I just couldn't resist myself. I always gave in to sin. Well, you can still give in to it today, but you don't have to because there's power in you to enable you not to. And Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's the hope of not falling short of his glory. It's the hope of getting closer and closer and finally hitting the bullseye. Because Christ lives in us, we're in the process now of becoming less and less like who we were and more and more like who we're supposed to be, which is like he is. We miss the mark less and less and we glorify him by being like him more and more. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then it gives us a list of a bunch of unrighteousness. Verse 11 says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. When I meet people from high school, they might say something to me like, you were a mess, you were a problem. Tommy Shepard, who was county executive, uh, told a guy, he said, Rocky Ramsey was mad at the world. And I was, and I had good reason to be. I was mad at the world. That's who I was. See, I don't have to keep being who I was. In Christ, I can become more like he is and less like I was. A follower of Jesus is now more than what he was and who he was. Because we were what we were, we did what we did, and because we did what we did, we were headed where we were headed. But God in Christ has saved us from where we were headed if we follow Jesus. He has saved us from what we have done if we follow Jesus. And he's saving us from who we are, which is what happens when we follow Jesus. How would you answer this question? Somebody came up to you and said, have you been saved? Are you being saved or will you be saved? How would you answer that question? The answer is yes. Yes. We have been saved from what we've done because of Christ's death on the cross and suffering hell for us. God has forgiven our sin. We have been saved. This is what the Bible calls justification. Remember in our text, we were justified by his blood. We are being saved from who we are. We're becoming less like we were and more like Jesus is because of his work in our life. This life-changing process is what the Bible calls sanctification. And then it says we will be saved from wrath. Our eternal destiny is now heaven. There were no longer... There, we will no longer have Adam's sinful nature. 1 John 3, 2 says that when we see him, we will be as he is. We will finally again rightly bear his image. We will have his character, his morality. That's what the Bible calls glorification. Jesus came, lived, and died to prove his love for you and to deliver you, save you. We use the word saved from your three biggest problems. But what he has done for you is of no value unless you turn to him. So the million dollar question this morning is, will you begin the life you were made for by turning to him? Will you follow him? Ask him to forgive you. If you do, he will. Give your life to him. We call it saying yes to God. Say yes to him this morning. 
saying yes is signing up for the best life I can have in a cursed world and an eternity that's out of this world. Decide to follow him and live the rest of your life for him and you can discover and experience the life you were made for. Listen closely. I told these boys yesterday morning, I said, I want to talk to you. It says in Ephesians chapter four, right after it talks about uh, God gives gifts to the church, including pastor, teacher. So if the church may attain the unity of the faith and it talks about becoming, developing mature men who have the stature of Christ. And so I told these boys, I said, I, I talked to them about being a man. You know what a man is? A man is a male who's becoming who God wants him to be. A male that's not becoming who God wants him to be is not a man, not by God's definition. He may call himself a man, you know, he may smoke, drink, cuss, and chew, uh, but it doesn't make him a man. God made man, God defines man. A man is someone who's becoming who God made him to be. And so that's my job to help you men, you males to become men help you uh, girls to become women, to become the people that God wants you to be. And until you be start becoming that person, you're not you. You're somebody else. God made you to be this person, but you're this person. You're not you. You wonder why life can't satisfy you? You know why you can't be fulfilled? You know why you feel so empty, so meaningless, so purposeless? Because you're living the life of an imposter. You're supposed to be this person following the Lord that you were made for. Instead, you're over here being this person. Oh, you might be deacon around spiritually a little bit, going to church here and there. But our, is your life, is the central purpose of your life being who God made you to be? If it is, you're becoming a man or a woman. You're becoming less like you were, more like he is. You're living less for what you want and more for what he wants. My prayer for you is that before you breathe your last, you'll become you.